Welcome to the lecture series American Literature Today. Tonight we are happy to welcome Nicholson Baker. You probably think that since Mr. Baker is specialized in telephone conversations, that our conversations went by telephone as well. Wrong. Mr. Baker prefers the fax. We communicated exclusively by fax. Since B Baker doesn't own a fax machine himself, he has taken up the habit of using the fax of his neighboring flower shop. And so it happened that our memos and messages landed between tulips and begonias in Murray Street. Ladies and gentlemen, Nicholson Baker. Mr. Baker will be introduced by Otte Jongstra, a typical, unpronounceable Dutch name. Otte Jongstra is author and Etty Jongstra. Would you think that a typical, terrible. pronounceable, it's terrible. terrible. He, is, uh, he will introduce Mr. Baker and his work. And after the break, which is in about an hour, uh, Hans Bertens, who teaches English language and literature in the Utrecht University, will lead the discussion. Enjoy your evening. I have a very large speech. which is called On Commas and Doorsteps, with an intermezzo on the nose in literature. What do a shoelace and a comma have in common? Or an escalator and a trunk call? Or the inside of a pillow and the place a footnote touches the text? Three difficult questions, but whoever poses them may begin to understand what Nicholson Baker's writing is about. So far, three of Nicholson Baker's books have appeared in Dutch, De Mezzanino, Kamertemperatuur, and Fox. Rather diverse books at first sight. Fox, in particular, written in dialogue form, stands apart. Baker's debut, De Mezzanine, and its successor room temperature being interior monologues, explorations in the head of an author who has declared this maxim of Flaubert as his motto, God in every de detail. Nicholson Baker seems obsessed by details. His work contains a host of perceptions of details, dry cleaners receipts, the mechanism and shape of a coffee machine, the history of drinking straws, pet names, terminology of bowel movements, and the shape of a chair, the pressure of a tire of a bicycle on the data hose for recording traffic on a public road, sound and air displacement of a pen while writing, you name it which makes reading it for the first time a rather tiring affair. <laughs> time and again, in the Mezzanine in particular, one feels afraid of losing one's way in that crowded office garden. Details, all right. But what about God? The same applies to room temperature, a meticulous description of what a father may be thinking about when bottle feeding his baby daughter, a string of tiny private thoughts and reflections. But is it also about something more universal concerning all of us without mentioning God in so many words? Let me consider some of those details. We'll see where we'll end up. In Fox, the female participant of an amazingly vi varied, amazingly long, 
an amazingly exciting erotic telephone call describes a sexual image. She is making love to three house painters. In Dutch, we would say winter painters. At the same time, in a remarkable position, lying through a hole in the wall lined with sheepskin, with her genitals and bottom in the hall where two painters are at work, and her face in close proximity to the painter doing the living room. Expertly and acrobatically, all three painters at the same time take advantage of the possibilities. The woman, meanwhile, lying like a comma bent with pleasure in the hole in the wall. That's her fantasy. Another detail. The male caller in Fox fantasizes that he and the woman are sitting on the couch watching a sex movie on video. Both are masturbating. They don't touch. Then he asks her whether he may touch her arm. He, feel the mus he feels the muscles working on her orgasm and thus reaches her genitals genitals through her arm. This last detail stands for the whole book, Fox. The telephone connection between him on the East Coast and her on the West Coast are the prosaic, prosaic connection bringing about an almost poetic climax. Through technology to God and pleasure, if you allow me the metaphor, Back to my starting point. Shoelaces, commas, escalators, the interspace between footnote and text. Again, connection seems to be the key word. But Nicholson Baker is not concerned with the elements that are connected, the tongues of his shoes with the eyelets, or floor A and floor B, nor even text and footnotes. In Fox, the three painters are not the protagonists, but the woman who connects them. Nicholson Baker is concerned with the interspace. In room temperature, he describes this space in comma-related metaphors. The momentary breath-held stillness between two phrases. Negative spaces an oasis of respiration. Commas evoking the rubber door stops dependable amenity, keeping the osteolis free from claws to claws, allowing metaphors to mix more freely. The thinness of the vacuum. Notwithstanding the abundant descriptions of very topical matters and the numerous Admiring accounts of the details of modern technology, this very fascination with interspaces places Nicholson Baker pro Nicholson Baker's prose within a tradition. Considering the text of the Mezzanino, Room Temperature and Vox and Fox, this need not surprise us. Time and again the author shows his great erudition. He is obviously well read, not only in literature on shoelaces or the resistance of the air and atmospheres. Hopkins, Tennyson, Verne, Shakespeare, Coleridge, Hergé, Gibbon, Casaubon, Baronius, Hermes Trismegistos, Milton, Emily Dickinson, Nabokov, a considerable number of reference books and encyclopedias, all these I found in room temperature alone, not only mentioned, but thoroughly absorbed. Boswell is one of the most striking names in the mezzanine. He turns up in the most remarkable footnote in this novel with footnotes. The note is remarkable because it's two-faced. 
in the first place it shows that the book ponders on itself. It is even more remarkable because it explains, and now I quote, they, and we're talking about Boswell, Lackey, and Gibbon now, they knew what the outer surface of truth, that the outer surf surface of truth is not smooth, welling and gathering from paragraph to shapely paragraph, but is encrusted with a rough protective bark of citations, quotation marks, italics, and foreign languages, a whole variorum crust of ibids and compares and sees that are the shield for the pure flow of argument as it lives for a moment in one's mind. Nicholson Baker continues with the words, the pleasure of sensing with peripheral vision, and thus joins ranks with surrealistic through seekers like Breton and Benjamin, two strollers who also knew the pleasure of peripheral, peripheral vision, and kept circling around the truth with remarkable endurance. The metaphor of surrealistic strollers through the arcades of Paris is related to Nicholson Baker's tree and bark metaphor in the said footnote. Truth, the core of things, is covered in a probably impenetrable layer of appearances. The arrival at that core being so far ahead in time and, and, and imagination that the idea of an un, uh, unattainable destination is the only means of survival. We potter about. We fumble a bit with the bark of a tree. When talking about the comma, on the other hand, Baker seems to take a different fixed standpoint and not to circle around the core. But his standpoint is peripheral as well. It's the interspace, the threshold, the border or whatever one may want to call it. Baker is right to speak about his two-faced theory. Truth abides in marginal spaces, in the air, between the lines, however difficult to perceive. For whatever way you look, truth is inside of yourself. Small wonder Baker's characters are introverts. So is his prose. It loves talking about itself. And now for my intermezzo on noses. I didn't mention Lawrence Stern among Nicholson Baker's list of authors' names. I may have overlooked it, but I hardly think so, loving introvert prose as I do, because Stern is a, perhaps even the, master of this kind of prose. I hesitate. Does not Baker mention him after all, be it indirectly? I cherish a very debatable theory on the nose in literature, almost against my better judgment. I once read Gogol's Dead, Soul and I was Dead Souls and was struck by the trumpeting sounds the protagonist produces in his handkerchief. Hold on, hadn't I read that before? But of course, in Stern's Tristram Shandy, a trumpet player, compares both sound and shape of his nose with the sound and shape of his instrument. In room, room temperature, I found some less blazing yet very beautiful nose lines, pardon me, almost seven pages on this jewel of the face. So this is my firm theory. Introvert literature is very keen on noses indeed. Earlier I mentioned Flaubert's God 
in every detail. I equate this God, of course, with core or truth, there being not much Christianity in Flaubert. If you want to speak about the God in Nicholson Baker's work at all, we end up in another, earlier culture. The patron of his prose is Janus, the Roman god of house and threshold, the two-headed go god. Two noses, too. He is one, might say, the ancient personification of his two-sided theory. Recently, a Dutch literary scholar has published a dissertation containing a splendid survey of the Janus literature, which links up beautifully with Nicholson Baker's prose. It is no coincidence that the title of the book refers to Benjamin and Breton, Sluiproutes and Dwaalwegen, Shortcuts and False Tracks. The said scholar, he as well, elevates the Paris walks to movements on the threshold. A beautiful turn, and quite right so, I think. Giving it a Bakerian twist, one could even consider this dissertation to be the fervently described essay on the theory of the comma in room temperature. Time to end this talk now, a stay in the interspace can be so pleasant as to lose sight of the time factor altogether. The space may, may be a thin vacuum, at the same time this negative space is so littered with books and people, I hardly know where to begin, or once started, where to end. My talk here was primarily meant to recommend Nicholson Baker's work yet again. Let me summarize. Apart from the playful and humorous strength of his work, there we go, his splendid sentences, the staggering arguments ad absurdum, the excitement he arouses in his reader's head and lower body, the unity of theme and variety of subjects, the explained inevitability it is being presented with, apart from all this, he makes one roam about in the world of literature. To me, Nicholson Baker's work is an oasis for aspiration. What more would I want? Thank you. Thank you very much for that um, immense and learned prolegomena. Um, I'm delighted to be here as part of the American Literature Today series of the John Adams Institute um, with the kind assistance of the Prince Bernard Foundation and Amber and Penguin and United Airlines and the Ramada Renaissance Hotel. Um, I, I'm not sure that I know anything firsthand about American literature today, uh, but I do know one thing, uh, which is that um, American writers are expected to give readings. And, and yet when I first delivered the manuscript of, of my novel Vox to my editor at Random House in the United States, I told him that I wasn't going to make any public appearances of any kind in connection with that book. Because, um, after all, it was a private conversation between two strangers over the phone, and uh, I, I felt that any sort of public performance or even public appearance would, would um, in, injure the useful, helpful quality of privacy that surrounded those two voices and made possible the things they found they could say to each other. And I, I thought that it would impair as well the equally important sort of privacy that surrounded the reader and the copy of the book that he or she was reading. And my editor agreed and said, fine, there would be no public appearances. But evidently there were some 
subsequent discussion at Random House because um, several months later I got in the mail a copy of the bound galleys of the book. That's the preliminary copy that's sent around to reviewers. And on the back, in the midst of a lot of promotional material, were the words in prominent italics, National Author Reading Tour. <laughs> so after some uh, spirited negotiation, um, we agreed that I would read aloud, make public appearances, but I wouldn't read aloud from any, any part of Vox or any of the earlier books, which I didn't want to do, but instead I would write something especially for that series of appearances. And when I was thinking about what I would write for them and, and what I would uh, write for this appearance tonight, I, it seemed to me that the, that, the, that the topic most in keeping, most personally relevant to the whole idea of publicity versus privacy was simply the topic of what it really feels like to give a reading. Um, what it feels like to go public, what it feels like to read aloud. And that's, that's what I've written about and that's what I will read aloud. A few years ago, I did my first reading. It was at the Edinburgh Festival in Scotland under a tent. Several others read, too, and we all sat on independent sections of a biomorphic orange modular couch, our heads bowed as we listened or half-listened to each other. Eventually, my turn came, and the words that I'd written in silence, an earplug-enhanced silence, in fact, that amplified the fleeting, chiclety contact of upper and lower incisors and made audible the inner squirt of an eyeball when I rubbed it roughly, and called to attention the muffled roar of eyelid muscles when my eyes were squeezed shut in an effort to see, using the infrared of prose, whatever it was that I most wanted at that moment to describe. These silent words unfolded themselves like lawn chairs in my mouth, and emerged one by one wearing large Siberian hats of consonants and long, erminous vowels, and landed softly without visible damage here and there in the audience, and I thought, Gosh, I'm reading aloud from chapter 7. Things went pretty well until I got to a place near the middle of the last paragraph where I began to feel, to my horror, that I was going to cry. I wouldn't have minded crying or at least pausing to swallow down a discreet, silent sob if what I'd been reading had been in any obvious way sad. When people on TV documentaries tell their story and they come to the part where the tragedy happens and they have to make themselves mouth those words again that in silent form they've adjusted two years earlier and they choke up, that's fine, they should choke up. And I've heard writers read autobiographical accounts of painful childhood events and quaver a little here and there. That's perfectly justifiable, even desirable. But the sentence that was giving me difficulty was a description of a woman enclosing a breakfast muffin in bakery tissue, placing it in a small bag and sprinkling it with coffee stirrers and sugar packets and pre-portioned pats of butter. Where was the pathos? <laughs> and yet by the time I willed those words, coffee stirrers, to the audience, I was in serious trouble and I noticed a listening head or two look up with sudden curiosity. Hmm, this is interesting. This American is going to weep openly and copiously <laughs> for us now. Why that sentence, though? Why did that image of a succession of small white shapes, more stirrers and sugar packets and butter pats than I needed, and in that sense ceremonial and semi-decorative rather than functional, falling, falling over my terrestrial breakfast, grab at my grief lapels? Well, there were a number of reasons why. In college, I'd once competed for a prize in what was called the Articulation of the English Language, for which the contestants had to read aloud from set passages of Milton and Joyce and others. I got to the auditorium late, having bicycled there, drinking proudly from a shot bottle of Smirnoff vodka that I'd bought on an airplane, and, as planned, I read the Milton in a booming, fake English accent, and read the Joyce excerpt, which was the last paragraph of The Dead, first in a broad, bad southern accent, then in a Puerto Rican accent, <laughs> and then in the southern accent again, and to my surprise I'd found that the Joyce suddenly seemed in my amateur TV actor drawl extremely moving, 
so that the last phrase about the flakes faintly falling over the living and the dead <laughs> were tragic enough to me that it wasn't clear whether my rhetorical tremor was genuine or not. And my voice box may have remembered this boozy, Joycean precipitation from college as I read aloud from my own sugar packet snowfall. Also, the chapter I was reading in Edinburgh had appeared in the New Yorker, and I'd had a slight disagreement, a friendly disagreement, with a fact checker there over the phrase tissue protected muffin. She held that the word tissue implied something like Kleenex and that it should be a paper wrapped muffin. And I'd said, no, no, no. And on the way home from work, I'd stopped in a bakery and spotted a blue box of the little squares in question, and I'd seen the words bakery tissue in capital letters on the side and exulting I'd called the manager of the store over a Greek man who barely spoke English and offered to buy the entire box <laughs> which he sold me for nine dollars and which I still have and I called my editor the next day and I said it's tissue it is <laughs> tissue and as a compromise it became in their version a tissue wrapped muffin but now, reading it aloud in Scotland, I could turn it into a tissue-protected muffin all over again. Right or wrong, I was able, in the end, to shield the original pre-verbal memory from alien breakfast guests with this fragile shroud of my own preferred words. It had turned out all right in the end. And that might have been enough to make me cry. But it wasn't just that. It was also that this tiny piece of a paragraph had never been one that I'd thought of proudly when I mentally glanced over my book. I'd neglected it. I'd forgotten it after writing it down. And now that my orating tongue forced me to pay attention to it, I was amazed and moved that it had hung in there for all those months, in fact years, unrewarded but unimpaired, holding its small visual charge without any further encouragement from me, and like the deaf and dumb kid in rags who, though reviled by the other children, ends up saving his village from some catastrophe, it was now proving to be the tearjerker moment that would force me, out of pity for its very unmemorableness, to dissolve in grief right in the midst of all my intended ironies. That was a big part of it. Contrition, too. Contrition made its contribution to the brimming bowl. For these Edinburgh audience members didn't know how much pure, mean-spirited contempt I'd felt back in my rejection letter days for writers who gave readings, how self-congratulatorily neo-primitivist I'd thought it was to repudiate the divine economy of the published page and require people to gather to hear a reticent man or woman reiterate what had long since been set in type. Ideally, I'd felt the Republic of Letters was inhabited by solitary readers in bed with their itty-bitty book lights glowing over their privately owned and operated pages like the ornate personal lamps that covertly illuminate every music stand in opera pits while the crudest sort of public melodrama rages in heavy makeup overhead. There was something a bit too pre-Raphaelite about the regression to an audience. I thought of those reaction shots in early Spielberg movies of family members gazing with softly awestruck faces at the blue-green glow of the beneficent UFO while John Williams flogged yet more Strauss from his string section. And there were the suspect intonation patterns, the I'm reading aloud patterns, especially at poetry readings where talented and untalented alike, understandably wishing in the absence of rhyme to give an audible analog for the ragged right and left margins in their typed or printed original, resorted to syllable-punching rhythms and studiously unresolved final cadences adapted from Dylan Thomas and Wallace Stevens overlaid with Walter Cronkite and John Fitzgerald Kennedy. These handy tonal templates could make anything lyrical. This is a Dover edition designed for years of use. Sturdy, stackable beechwood bookshelves at a price you'd expect to pay for plastic. <laughs> and yet, despite all this sort of easy, Glenn Gouldy contempt in my background, there I was physically in Edinburgh under that tent among strangers, finishing up my own first reading, 
And far from feeling dismissive and contemptuous before my turn came, I'd been simply and sincerely nervous, exceedingly nervous. And now I was almost finished and I, finished and I hadn't done anything too humiliating. And the audience had innocently listened, unaware of my prior dr disapproval, and they'd even tolerantly laughed once or twice, and all this was too much. I was like a crippled unbeliever wheeled in and made whole with a sudden palm blow to the forehead by a preaching charlatan. I'm reading aloud, I'm reading aloud, I was saying, my face streaming with tears. I was, I was cripple and charlatan simultaneously. Evidently, I was going to cry out of pure gratitude to myself for having gotten almost to the end without crying. And then, as the unthinkable almost happened, and the narcissus bulb in the throat very nearly blossomed, I recognized that if I did break down now, the intensity of my feeling in this supposedly comic context would leave the charitable listeners puzzled about my overall mental well-being. At the very least, I would be thought of someone going through a stressful time. <laughs> and it would be this diagnosis they would take home with them rather than any particular fragment from what I'd read that they liked. And whenever I tried to write something light and lively thereafter, I would remember my moment of shame on the orange couch and to counteract it, I'd have to invent something bleak and brooding and wholly out of character. I couldn't let it happen. I couldn't let reading aloud distort my future output. I started whispering urgent ringside counsel to myself. Come on, you sack of shit. If you cry, people will assume you're being moved to tears by your own eloquence. And how do you think that will go over? That was frightening enough, finally, to stabilize the nutation in my Adam's apple. And I just barely got through to the last word. And since that afternoon in 1989, I've read aloud a number of times from my writing, and each time I've been a little more in control, less of a walking cripple, more of a charlatan. I've reacquainted myself with my voice box. When I was 14, I used to feel it each morning at the kitchen table before I had any cereal. It was large. How could my throat have been retrofitted with this massive service elevator? And what was I going to say with it? What sort of payloads was it fated to carry? First thing in the morning I could sing in a fairly convincing baritone the sax solo from pictures at an exhibition. And as I went for a low note, there was a unique physical pleasure not to be had later in the day when the two thick slack vocal cords dropped and closed on a shovel full of sonic peat moss. Sometimes as I sang low or swung low, it felt as if I were a character actor in a coffee commercial, carelessly scooping glossy beans from deep in a burlap bag and pouring them into a battered scale. The deeper the note I tried to scoop up, the bigger and glossier the beans until finally I was way down in fava territory. I was Charles Kuralt, I was Tony the Tiger, I was Lloyd Bridges, I was James Earl Jones. I too had a larynx the size of a picnic basket. I felt, and when you heard me, you wouldn't even know it was sound, it would be so vibrantly low. You'd think instead that your wheels had strayed over the wake-up rumble strips on the shoulder of a freeway. Just above the mobile prow of the Adam's apple, just above where there should properly be a hood ornament, was a softer place that became more noticeable to the finger the lower you spoke or sang, and it was directly into this vulnerable opening, this, this chink, it, this chink in the armor of one's virility that I imagined DJs secretly injecting themselves with syringes full of male hormones and small engine oil so that they could say traffic and weather together with the proper sort of sawtooth bite. And though my own voice is proven to be, despite my high secondary sexual expectations, and even though I was pretty tall, and tall people often have vox boxes to match, not quite the pebbly, three-dimensional mood machine that I'd counted on. I do occasionally now, like reading aloud what I've written, I get back a little of the adolescent early morning feeling as I brachiate my way high into the upper canopy of a sentence, tightening the pitch muscles, climbing up, and then dropping on a single word with that Doppler effect plunge of sound 
so that the argument can live out its closing seconds at sea level. I feel all this going on, even if it isn't audible to anyone else. And sometimes I know that my voice, imperfect medium though it may be, is making what I've written seem, for the moment, better than it is. And I like playing with this dangerous intonational power and even letting listeners know that I'm playing with it. It's not called an Adam's apple for nothing. That relic of temptation, that articulated chunk of upward mobility, that ever-ready dial tone in the throat, whether or not it successfully leads others astray, ends by thoroughly seducing oneself. Thank you. Your uh, reading aloud um, has much in common with your fiction, <laughs> if, if I may say so. Um, well, what we'll do now is um, first, Arthur and I uh, will fire questions at, uh, at Nicholson for, say, 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll have a break, uh, coffee or uh, alcoholic, whatever you want. And after, say, 15, 20 minutes, that's 9, 15, 9, 20, we'll return here and the, uh, the floor will be open and you will be able to ask your own questions. Yeah, so you can brood, start brooding on them uh, right now. Um, <clears throat> let me first um, correct something that, um, that Anna said um, in int introducing me. Uh, she said you that I taught teach English literature. I do not. I teach American literature. Uh, and and I, want you to know, I want you to know that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here, as a matter of fact. Um, let, let, let's start with uh, Mezzanine, your first novel, um, if you don't mind. I mean, there will there'll be lots of questions on Fox, I'm sure. So, so, so let's start with the more innocent stuff, right? Yes. <clears throat> Um, I mean, what, what, what strikes the reader is the, uh, the tone of innocent uh, delight, I mean, the, the sheer pleasure that the, uh, uh, the narrator takes in, uh, in small problems, in the in intractability of, uh, of the real world. Um, I mean, you, you, the narrator comes over like a very benevolent Kafka, uh, or a very benevolent uh, Peter Handke. Um, and the reader is struck by these incredibly detailed descriptions of, say, fairly trivial things that you run into during the course of a day, like, say, breaking a shoelace, whatever. And yet, I couldn't keep wondering, um, while reading that stuff, which sometimes is difficult to visualize. I mean, it's, it's so detailed that it's very difficult to picture in your mind what is actually uh, going on. Um, and I kept wondering whether you wrote, say, from, from memory or from photographs, uh, or that you actually did some, some easel writing, as, as painters do, outdoor painters do easel painting out there in the wilds of, of nature. Um, so how, how do you do this? How, how do you arrive at these incredibly detailed descriptions of, say, uh, a vending machine breaking a shoelace, um, an escalator, what have you. How does it work in practice? Well, generally, it doesn't work very well to have the, the thing that you're describing right there because it interferes. It, 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 you can't magnify it sufficiently to, to get all the information from it. So I generally work by trying to remember and recreate the what it looked like in my mind. I tend to have maybe one or two good ideas a month. <laughs> and then um, I, I write a version of them down. And then uh, I, I rewrite them many times. And then eventually they seem to have, to have developed, have matured enough that I, I feel that they're worthy of inclusion. The rule about the mezzanine was that I wouldn't include any any idea in it that I hadn't thought of at least say 20 or 30 30 times so um, it was a, it was really sort of a uh, um, a 
a question of, of finding the, the thoughts that, that continue to cycle around and then finding a way to, to situate them in a, in a stream and on, on an escalator, perhaps, that would, would make sense moving from one to the yeah. next. Yeah. Uh, and you do your own fact finding, that is, you go back uh, occasionally to the thing you described to see whether things are indeed as you described them. Yes, but the, I wanted the narrator of the mezzanine not to be an expert in anything. I wanted him to be a, a normal person. Who, you know, that these thoughts are perhaps the thoughts that anybody could have. It's just that I happen to have chosen to write about them. Mm -hmm. So that he's, no, he's not an expert on the mechanics of escalators or vending machines or the flotational characteristic of straws. But I did towards the end get so interested by some of the ideas that, <laughs> that I had to go into the uh, MIT library several days in a row and kind of <laughs> look them up. And, that, yep. um, and that's where I found some of the citations on the uh, cable fatigue and the slippage strength of shoelaces and all that. <laughs> <laughs> they really exist. I mean, those were oh, real yeah, articles. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I believe that. <laughs> <laughs> Please believe me. Yeah. We wouldn't dare to do to think anything else. Yeah. Well, I mean, the 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 interest um, uh, comes through. I mean, the the narrator is obviously fascinated by by how things work, and um, at at several points, I was reminded of the I mean, the the sort of boys literature that is you know for for adolescent boys 15 16 that was published in say the 1950s um, i mean before everything had to be adventure uh, or science fiction <clears throat> i mean way back in the 50s one finds these novels for uh, for adolescent boys that really describe things i mean that show you how machinery works um, and what one, one finds the same fascination in uh, in those novels um, There's always, uh, not always, but um, sometimes there's a, a slightly puzzled tone at how, say, reality works uh, in, in, in the mezzanine. Um, and I was reminded uh, occasionally of the, uh, no, let me first read a sentence and then let me tell you what I was reminded of. I mean, very early in that novel, um, there's on page six uh, the following sentence. I would leave holding the quart coolly. This is a quart of milk, I think. Um, I, <laughs> uh, I would leave holding the quart coolly in one hand, as if it were a big reference book I had to consult so often that it bored me. Now, this reminded me of the stuff that Richard Browdingham um, used to write in the uh, in the 1960s and 70s, and of course I'm not accusing you of imitating Browdingham, but uh, we find that same sort of innocent delight in uh, in uh, developing metaphors um, and developing totally implausible metaphors uh, in 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 Browdingham. Um, is there any sort of say subconscious influence there, or have you ever been intrigued by Browdingham or the stuff that he did? Well, um, I, I haven't I haven't read any Browdingham, but I um, I <laughs> so much I fun. think that I think that every writer does have a, a a sort of a best emotion. You know, you can think that say Philip Roth is best at anguish, or and I think that uh, I write best when I'm in a state of of simple excitement. You know, that I I like I like best simply celebrating things being. I don't write about things very well unless I'm pleased about them in some way and want to be a kind of salesman on their behalf. Um, so that maybe that my my exuberance is my best emotion or something. I I do think you're right too about that the resemblance about to the those uh, 1950s books about uh, how how things work, how machines work. My great grandfather, in fact, wrote. At the turn of the century, um, or a little later, uh, a book called *The Boy's Book of Inventions*, um, <laughs> detailing, you know, these these marvelous uh, things like the hot air balloon, you know. and and. Um, but on the other hand, you know, it's it seems unfair to to limit the excitement to boyhood. I mean, these 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 machines are wonderful, and and what what happens with machines? like escalators is that 
you get past the gee whiz phase, and yet you still have to ride them, and and eventually you accumulate a whole host of secondary emotions um, that surround them, and those also can be interesting. Um, as adult, uh, you know, adult kind of emotions. So um, I, I guess I wanted to maybe you know bring the bring the boy's book of inventions past its adolescence into adulthood. Is is that okay? Uh, um, let's let's say jump to um, uh, to room temperature. Uh, although, although I'd like to come back to this. Um, there is some of that in room temperature too, uh, but you're distracted, as it were, by um, our, the, the narrator. <laughs> let me let me not confuse you with your narrators. Uh, the narrator is is distracted by uh, by by the baby, and um, um, it's it's true that the baby triggers say, similar responses, uh, but there's say um, more. What do you want? Depth. That's not really the word. Um, so say there's um, um, at least uh, two centers of, of excitement in in, uh, in room temperature. There's the continual interest in in detail uh, in how in how things work. I mean, you, uh, at the very mechanisms of, of of things. But there's also the interest in that in that new life. Uh, did that interfere uh, with each other while you were writing that book? Uh, it's, it seems to me, if I may say, be a little bit critical, that every now and then there, there is that interference, that it's not easy to go from the one emotion to the other emotion. Mm. Well, I think, I mean, it, writing loses its interest unless you feel you're taking risks with every book. And, uh, you know, with the mezzanine I was risking writing a whole book about this guy going out to buy a pair of shoelaces, you know, and, and saying, sort of implicitly claiming that this was a Tolstoyan subject of, you know, great moment. And with the second book, I, um, I wanted to risk being sentimental because in America it's almost, uh, it's the only taboo left. You cannot be sentimental in literature. Uh, so I wanted to do that. That was exciting. And there's also a, a, a progression I, I hope in that the first book is this guy uh, uh, looking at machines. So he and the stapler, you know, and, and, and really that's the transaction. In the second book, there is another person in the room. It just happens to be a six month old child, so it's not a speaking role, but we have two people in the room. Then with Updike, there's uh, the third book, which hasn't been translated, but um, uh, is, a, is a book about my imagined relationship with John Updike. Um, there, there's me, it's an autobiographical book, and then there's John Updike, and, and I actually quote John Updike. So in a sense, even though we aren't in the same room, there's, there's this going back and forth. And then finally, uh, after much struggle with Vox, I actually have two people <laughs> talking to each other. <laughs> They're still not in the same room, but I'm feeling that I'm, you know, I'm moving slowly. <laughs> towards this <laughs> it's, it's a major breakthrough <laughs> this millennium where there really will be two people in the same room yeah <laughs> talking yeah I mean you'll, you'll end up writing the group in say 20 years time <laughs> <laughs> rewriting Please, the group if I'm yeah. lucky yeah <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> why, why Updike by the way I mean now that you mentioned the, 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 the third novel which has not been translated unfortunately uh, why, why Updike I mean there's reasons I think but I would like to hear you <laughs> Spell them out if possible. I mean, well, why not Bello or say Malamud? Oh no, he's dead. Not Malamud, but um, it's Roth, um, Pension, you name it. Why? Why Updike specifically? Well, Updike is the is the living American writer or living writer that I've thought about most continuously, and 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 he's sort of the model of of the American man of letters. So everyone in my generation has very complicated and ambivalent feelings about him. And, but I really wanted to use him not, so that even people who didn't know Updike or care about Updike would think of this as a kind of case study of what it's like to remember and not remember what you read. What I did was I wrote the book without any preparation. I haven't read all of Updike. In fact, I've read less than half of what he's written. And instead of going back and reading the books in series to prepare, I just, 
I just started writing the book. And I, I had to depend entirely on the little that I remembered of the books that I'd read. And it just it seemed to be truer to the way we really use what we've read than if I had prepared. So it was just uh, my, my um, a core sample yeah. of what I knew about this particular writer. Yeah, is there, is there a certain affinity between, between, say, your position and Applike's position, both, um, um, say, uh, white sort of middle of the road Americans, um, both interested in, um, uh, say, middle class Americans, uh, both interested in detail. I mean, after all, Updike is also pretty strong on uh, on detail. Uh, is, is, is there also this kind of interest in um, in in Updike as as someone that you especially want to grapple with, um, because he's in a sense too close for, uh, too close for comfort. Mm -hmm. Sure. I Sure. I want to. There's the, obviously the the uh, there's a he's this powerful stylistic influence, and everybody you know my age has to has to work his way around him. And in a way, I wanted you and I to be, though it was an homage to Updike, to be so different in style and technique that it would show that I wasn't you know in in the tradition of Updike. I wanted to do both those things at the same time. Well, you, you're not, I think, in a tradition of Abdike, even though uh, you share this interest in detail with and him. We, he, he, he wouldn't have, I mean, Abdike is always looking for God, and as, as Arthur have pointed out, you're not. That's a, a major difference, I think. But we are both dead white males. So <laughs> yes, yeah, so you sure are. Yeah. <laughs> now, this is, by the way, for, uh, uh, this is a new category in the U.S., dead white males. Um, uh, writers who are totally uninteresting uh, to, say, um, uh, politically correct uh, Americans. I mean, this is a category in the U.S. that is not spoken of anymore, dead white male writers, like Nicholson Baker here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let me, um, before we break, um, The New Yorker. You mentioned your fact finder. I'm amazed, by the way, that, that uh, a, a fact finder uh, would would object to something in uh, in a piece of fiction, but that's only by the way. Uh, <laughs> the New Yorker. That's where you started your career as a writer. Um, now, Updike, of course, <laughs> Updike, of course, also wrote for the New Yorker for a very long time, and probably started his career there. Um, why why the why the New Yorker? I mean, there, there's so many. Um, literary magazines, periodicals uh, in the U.S. Um, uh, do they pay better than, than the others? Or, I mean, what's special about the New Yorker for you? Well, the New Yorker is is uh, has this nice virtue of being not a literary magazine, but a general magazine. So you feel that even though they take tremendous care with their writers and, and, and never have typographical errors or almost ever. One of the few typographical errors I've ever seen in The New Yorker was in my first published story, in fact. <laughs> they, they began the parenthesis and then there was no closed parenthesis. Oh. <laughs> um, so I felt that I'd, I'd made history of a sort. But um, they, they just, they're general enough, mainstream enough, and yet are careful and literary and have taste. And so it's, it's every writer's, well, it's some writer's dream to be in that magazine. Um, and then, of course, you, the struggle later on is to, to show how you are not a New Yorker writer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah they, they, they also go in for a certain sort of, say, experimentalism. Um, would you, would you qualify your your say writing, especially say the first books, um, as as experimental? Um, I don't like to think of myself as postmodern or uh, you know try, experimental. I want to think of myself as as simply thorough, methodical. That like a good graduate student, I pick a narrow topic and then give it everything it deserves. I, I, I want to be thought of simply as a realist. Were you a graduate student once? <laughs> um, 
No, I, I, I think that's one of the problems. I've, I never did get, get to be a, a graduate student, and so I've had to put some of the scientific uh, instincts into, into my prose. You're, you're a lot more thorough than lots of graduate students I know and have known. <laughs> um, let's, let, let's have a break here and meet again in, say, uh, 20 minutes. Okay. <laughs> Second leg of this uh, of this meeting, um, if if one can uh, can say that. Um, first, uh, I'm going to ask um, Nicholson a couple of questions about his connection with the New Yorker. Uh, this is mainly for the benefit of the <laughs> of, of the video camera that's running, uh, because in the near future there's going to be a program on uh, on the uh, the New Yorker as a I see a literary cultural magazine, um, and uh, some people would like to have some footage of a, a well-known writer saying things about a New Yorker. Uh, <laughs> then, um, then um, Otto uh, will come in with a question, and after one, that, one question, yes. only one question, and after that, uh, we will throw the whole thing wide open, and, and you will get the uh, um, you get the opportunity that you have been craving for the last say 45 minutes. Um, okay, first then, those, you know, those, those New Yorker questions. Um, is, is the New Yorker actually the first magazine that you approached with your unpublished manuscripts? Um, did you do some writing in school? Uh, did you publish locally, uh, statewide, or did you go nationwide immediately with the New Yorker? I think my first rejection letter was from the Atlantic, but I, I, then I got a number of rejection letters from the New Yorker. I have um, maybe you know 80 or 90 rejection letters from various literary magazines. 80 but, or 90. But the New Yorker is the most. The, they have a beautiful, stately little rejection letter, that, um, and they. I remember that they had the they had the classiest paper clips. They had a, a wavy. <laughs> wavy paper clip. I felt that they really they put their money in the right place. <laughs> um, but uh, my first publication, my first published story, for better or worse, was in a little magazine called the Little Magazine. And uh, <laughs> then, uh, and I'd, I'd always wanted to be the, the way the re real writers are first published in the New Yorker and they go on to a string of successes. But. So, but unfortunately, the little magazine accepted me and published me just, and it came out just a week and a half before the New Yorker came out. So I was doomed to be a late bloomer. <laughs> I, I can see that, yeah. Um, but you recovered, fortunately. Um, uh, you still write for the New Yorker occasionally, or have you broken completely with the. Uh, no, with no, the New no. I, 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 the last thing I published was the Talk of the Town. Piece and an anonymous. They're all their talk of the town pieces uh -huh. are anonymous. Um, a, a, a piece about <clears throat> an ice storm that happened in my hometown. But the New Yorker, um, after I got in, also then rejected me a number of times. Um, oh, they still do that. Yeah, it's not as if you're in the club and then you're. You know, they uh, they. I think that's good. They want people to write their best, and the only way to do that is to keep people scared. All right. So, <laughs> so, so, so even if, if you belong to the stable, as it were, you can get kicked out. Yes. Yeah. At any right. time. Yeah. I mean, the, does that mean that there's um, there's obviously enough competition uh, okay. then for them to be able to do this? I mean, they can afford to do this. I mean, does that mean that say every aspiring young writer uh, is dreaming of being published in the New Yorker? Yes, I think they get some num something like 40,000 uh, unsolicited manuscripts a year. And I, I, I once tried to do the math, and it, it turned out that given that, I think they had eight fiction editors, so each editor had to reject four stories a day or something like that. <laughs> but I can't, I, well, that's probably not right. But anyway, there's a, there's a kind of a steady yeah, I see. flow that they have to deal with. Yeah, uh, but you're, you're from New York yourself. Uh, you, you never considered going west, for instance, uh, to San Francisco, uh, Los Angeles with your stories, your, your, your fiction? 
Oh no, I sent them everywhere. I, I uh, uh, it just happens that the New Yorker is, is called the New Yorker, but really it's a national magazine. Yeah. The, um, but I sent when I was in my rejection days, they I was sending them to Ohio and uh, you know any any state, any city, any literary magazine that had any that, that had a nice layout and looked you know appropriately pretentious. <laughs> they got my stories, and then they sent them quickly back. <laughs> Do you, you have an explanation for that? Well, it takes a long time to, for every writer to find, you know, whatever it is original that he has to contribute. And, you know, if you're 22 years old, it's not very likely that, unless you're a prodigy, that, that, that that's happened yet. So um, it took unless me... Unless you say Brett Easton Ellis or somebody like him. Right. That may have, that may have happened. <laughs> In his case, <laughs> or Karsten, Karsten McCullers, uh, but 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 we talk about young grown-ups too, of course. So, um, it's probably better to break it to print if you're a little bit older than uh, older than that. Um, okay, um, I think we got it <laughs> fully covered. Uh, so let's now turn to uh, to Arthur, um, who question. wants to question you yes, on I, I think some aspect of the yes. uh, of the mezzanine. I already uh, said that um, all those details in, in, in your novels uh, may uh, look, for the, for the first reading anyway, a bit tiring. Don't you think all those footnotes are even more tiring? You should know, by the way, that he does that himself. I mean, he's published a novel which contains lots of foot, lots of yes. foot Well, I'm just, I'm just repeating a, a question which uh, people asked me. And mm. Well, I like footnotes, and I, I felt in a way that I was doing a service to the reader, in that you know, <laughs> if, if he or she didn't, didn't want to follow my in-depth discussion of the flotational characteristics of the straw, could just carry on with the main <laughs> text, but if if there was the interest and the and the willingness, you know, the reader could follow me down there to that that compressed little ghetto of of type, and and we could both uh, frolic around down on the bottom for a while. <clears throat> but I I I am not of the school of writers who want to make the reader uncomfortable. I want, above all, to be liked in a kind of pathetic way. <laughs> um, so uh, you, you want to read it to cry? Yeah. I, well, yeah, or or laugh or something. But I, I so I wanted the footnotes really to be just. Um, they were an act of desperation for me. I had more to say than I thought could conveniently be accommodated by each paragraph, and so the, the compression just helped. Uh, sort of helped the typography, helped the look of it. Didn't you even confuse the reader more? Because some, some footnotes are uh, not exactly uh, helping the main story. I already mentioned the Boswell note in the end, mm. but uh, I think you drag the reader down into the depths of the library in a way. Well, but those are that. That's the joyous thing about footnotes is that they do have this heterogeneous uh, complexity. They, um, you know, they are the points of contact with the rest of the world. The the book is this self-contained unit, but the footnotes point, you know, carry one outward. Um, to that's to to other books and to to other uh, observations. <laughs> um, so I. <laughs> well, no, well, that's. <laughs> well, to but it's not a boring question, you know. <laughs> but uh, I'm asking that because uh, uh, I think that uh, I I wrote a critic about uh, your uh, the, the mezzanine once, and um, I called it I think uh, a library in the office garden, a librarian in the office garden, but especially. The footnotes drag you down into the library, not so much the text itself. Well, most of the footnotes... The, what, what, what kind of function does a library have uh, uh, in this very clean, superficial, uh, described... <laughs> pardon me... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, office garden? What, what's the connection between the office garden and the library? 
I already have more questions than one. Let's Appar worry apparently, about this. yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, I, you I told me. <laughs> yes. Well, um, well the, the, you know, I, I, I like the idea that corporate life has this kind of formica, this smooth, clean quality that I'm that I could be kind of a clean realist, but. But the footnotes are a way of adding some kind of grit, uh, some kind of messiness to the whole thing. I mean, why can't one be scholarly about anything? And, and, but really, most of the footnotes aren't a kind of mock scholarship. Most of them don't refer to writing, but refer simply to, to have more to say about you know, staplers or date stampers or any of these other little handheld objects yes. that are so important to us all. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, a, 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 a final remark, and then we'll turn the whole thing over to the public. Um, I'm, I'm struck by the way that, and other <coughs> um, remarks on this in this in this introduction, I'm struck by how, uh, in your in your work, fictions emerge from. Uh, say the interstices between things and, be, and between people. Vox uh, uh, emerges out of the actual physical distance of, of these two people. If they were together in one room, they wouldn't be talking, right? Or, or at least one assumes that they wouldn't be talking, but we would be doing other things, uh, maybe as pleasurable, uh, maybe not. Um, but it's, it's the distance between these two people that makes the fiction possible and that makes it possible for them to fictionalize. Uh, at lots of points in that, in that novel, um, a sexual fantasy is developed by one of the two speakers, and, and the other one picks it up and develops it further. And then it's taken back again by, by, by the first speaker, right, who de develops it further again. Uh, so the, the, fiction, the fictionalizing process emerges out of that space. Uh, and, I mean, this is a very literal example, but one also sees it in room temperature, uh, in, uh, in the mezzanine. Fiction em emerges out of the distance between people, and the distance between, uh, say, people and the object world out there. Is, is that a conscious strategy on your part, um, or is this simply, say, a, a habit of mind? Is this your own emotional outlook on the world that comes into this, that sort of suggests this strategy to you? Well, it's, it's, it's too easy just to say that X character loves Y character. And what you have to do is say X character actually was, you know, picked up the earplugs of Y character and put it in his ear. So you have to, if you root the sentiment around a thing, you end up with maybe a more a, 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 an inch more interesting texture for whatever emotion. But I'm oh I'm interested in, in emotions, but but I like them to, to take baroque exotic roots. And the telephone is this miraculous machine, you know, that narrows the stream of communication down to a single filament. The two characters have to depend, as you said, entirely on language and on the inflections that they give to words. They have to finish their sentences. You know, and that's that's important to a writer. I have a solemn duty to finish my own sentences. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, <laughs> let's not turn it over to you. Um, if if you have uh, questions, that is, I'm sure you have. Um, uh, except for a small percentage, I think, uh, of people in the world, we can all write, but we are not all writers. Um, Except for a lot of discipline and hard work, to what to, to what do you attribute that difference? Um, a writer friend of mine says that a lot depends on the fearlessness, the real power and, and strength and courage to to break through the crust that we use to protect ourselves and to really expose ourselves on the page. Do you agree with that? Well, maybe there is something to that. There's this kind of fierce feeling that you get. Um, well, that I got, for instance, in writing Vox, where I, I kind of I gleefully said to myself, you know, I'm a pornographer. <laughs> you know, um, and it was it's very liberating to 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 say that. But uh, we haven't said that. We have not used that word. No, but well, for better or worse, it didn't turn out to be pornography. You know, it turned out to be a work of art. But um, <laughs> um, but you know, there there is there's this. You have to work yourself up into the fearless state, and then. Uh, 
you know, fearlessness combined with magnification or something like some mixture of, of fearlessness and uh, and simply an attentiveness to to words and mixing making the tolerances tighter between nouns and adjectives and things. But sure. I think if I may say something, uh, it's... Uh... No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I've said enough, I think. <laughs> Let's... No, but it has to do with... Uh... <laughs> can't, can't keep myself, sorry. Writers are fearless, right? <laughs> this, is, this is a demonstration. Uh, yes, yeah, a demonstration of fearlessness, yes. No, but I mean, if you, if you want to carpet a, cu a, a cupboard, you have to have technique for that. And that's the same with, uh, it's not only hard work, and it's not only, uh, you have to, you have to uh, learn the trade. It's not only hard work, my God. Not everybody can write. You have to specialize yourself on, uh, I don't want. I don't. I don't want to do. Uh, how do you call it? Uh, panasic like, panasus uh, like uh, uh, about <coughs> writing. But uh, it's still, you, you 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 close yourself up. You lock yourself up in an office and you start to work. But the, then then you start. Uh, you you come up with the difficulties of the of the of the job, like a carpenter who wants to make a cupboard. You have to specialize yourself on the job itself. It's not just that everybody can write. I mean, if you, uh, everybody who specializes on, on writing, that's something else. <laughs> then it's just a matter of ideas. Okay, back to the... Reality. Back to the audience. Uh, yeah, I wonder if uh, you or anybody else have tried to um, calculate how long it takes for the conversation in box to take place and uh, what telephone tariff rates it goes on in. <laughs> <laughs> I just wonder how much it costs uh, if you did it in real life. It <laughs> yeah, well, it depends. Uh, sorry, I was going to say, I asked yeah. that for totally frivolous reasons, but because it seems that as uh, human interaction is increasingly taking place in an electronic virtual network with increasing interactivity and uh, engagingness of uh, uh, presence. Um, I wonder if in America there was more of a political dimension to our access to telecommunications because uh, it seems like there's a lot of economic and legal things that need to be got around such as censorship and uh, having charge for access to these, uh, this new world that is happening. Um, well, the, the first part, I'd be very curious to know how much it really cost. I mean, the, the people, uh, is it Entertainment Weekly magazine has this little column where they calculate how much the furs in X movie really cost and everything, and I wish they would figure this out. But it really depends on how slowly the characters talk, of course, and I want the reader to, you know, make it go fast or slow, depending on how he or she wants it to go. So I, don't, I think it would be between, say, uh, say two and a half and four and a half hours. So that's and since they're spending two dollars a minute, that's there's they're spending a considerable amount of money. They're each spending that much money, and and it's it's almost it's it's you know they're simply they're spending a fortune simply for the privilege of talking to each other. And I guess if there was you know some straightforward moral it's that um, you know when it's good conversation is priceless and that these two people who are just single people getting by sexually happen to have run into each other and uh, and it's just very important to them to be able to talk and have this courtship all compressed into these three hours as far as the political dimension um, I, there is some some toing and froing in America right now about the fact that 900 numbers and 800 number sex lines should be made illegal or more difficult uh, to access. Um, and I, you know, maybe there are good arguments in favor of that. But uh, I guess I I thought that 
the novelist's duty is to respond to technical innovations and this, to find the social, explore the social possibilities. And that's what these two characters in their playful way are doing is saying, well, here's this neat invention, the telephone, not only the telephone, but this complicated billing system that allows strangers to talk. What can, what social, new social forms can we evolve collaboratively out of that? Yeah, it's funny. They were there used to be ten cents a minute in Boston. There was a whole, time, but it, the price suddenly went up, and I think organized crime got involved. <laughs> <clears throat> That's what I heard, anyway. Uh, this, there's always a political dimension. How did you research? Um, well, I I didn't call any of the sex numbers. <laughs> Um, we'll believe that. We'll believe well, that. While I was working on the book, because I didn't want to disturb the delicate mood that I was creating um, <laughs> between the two characters, I did call them afterwards to see to make sure that that you know I, I technically could um, that the two characters could meet. And then there's this they, the, what, the way the book starts is that they've already shunted off into a to a one-on-one -on -one connection out of this so-called party line. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I didn't, uh, when I listened, I didn't sit there with a yellow pad taking notes. This is a, this is an imagined conversation. This is a hypothetical, a fable almost. What if two reasonably amiable um, people were to call and were to hit it off? This might be the transcript of what they would say. I have one more question about you. Uh, we were talking about the footnotes. I haven't read that book. I'm very curious because I always read footnotes, even when they're terribly boring. <laughs> but um, you you mentioned that when you read the, the footnotes that you will, would refer to other books. Aren't you afraid you're going to lose your reader if they go and read the other books? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the nice thing about footnotes is the reader can figure out what he or she wants to do. I mean, I, I heard that someone read the whole book without reading any of the footnotes, and then read the footnotes in series afterwards. You know, my, own uh, my own way of doing it would probably have been to open the book, read all the footnotes, and ignore the main text entirely. You know. But, you know, it's up to the, if, 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 if there was a citation that was entrancing, I would uh, recommend that the, you know, that the reader just go off and go to the library immediately. By the way, why didn't you put a register in? <laughs> we, uh, read an index. On names and uh, oh. and subjects. Well, it's a novel. It's, it's a novel, and it's a, that seemed well, uh, mock well. mock scholarly. Yeah, I be also because Updike had used the index index in in the center. Uh, no, in uh, Beck, I think. Was it, was it? It, yes, he had an index in Beck, but he also had an index of of mythological references in the Centaur, and I thought I would be shamelessly plagiarizing Updike if I did. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give him 10 seconds. Yeah, there's two. Oh, uh, you sorry. were first on the European. Well, we had a brief talk just outside now. You said something about your um, admiration for Updike, but also the problems you have with him. Could you elucidate that? Well, I, there's a passage in you and I about how I think that he's a mean person. You know that he uh, that he he writes things about his wife, his now his ex-wife, that are so nakedly autobiographical and so critical that it seems almost criminal of him to um, to put those those criticisms in a book. And he also criticizes. Uh, a, an early, a small press that published some early n novels by Nabokov, and he says that it's a miserable little bindery. And I just imagined the poor, you know, employees of this little press that that publish these nice little books coming to work the next day after reading miserable little bindery and looking at each other and saying, you know, we're not a miserable little bindery. <laughs> you know, it just seemed, uh, you know, needlessly harsh. <laughs> 
So that's that's the sort of criticism, a very personal kind of criticism, as opposed to, you know, he he uses metaphors incorrectly here or something scholarly. Mm -hmm. Well, gentlemen in the back there, Wilfred. Yeah. Okay. Hey, um, I, I gather from several of your interviews that before you took up writing professionally, that you were in fact a technical writer. Now, in the mentioning, you get quite a lot of sort of technical detail about details. Well, the, the two things I'd like to know. First of all, um, what, what was it when you what you actually specialised in when you were a technical writer? Because, for example, in Fox, you get sort of quirky metaphors like cotterless drive shaft, which you can't even find in a normal dictionary. And you get, you get more like these. So I thought, maybe, did you write manuals on mechanical or on mechanical subjects? Or? Uh, the manuals that I wrote were on uh, software, computer software. The, really, the way the chronology worked was that I wrote a, a, a part of what ended up to be the mezzanine as a short story for the New Yorker. It was chapter seven. It was about a guy getting dressed for work, and there and there's you know in-depth dis, dis, uh, description of what it feels like to have a a button go through a buttonhole and you know the the just the technique of putting on deodorant while when, once the shirt is already on. And I thought um, I thought that since I since I could write this how-to manual on getting dressed in the morning that I, and, and my wife was pregnant and, you know, I had, to, I had to get a legitimate job that I might be able to get a job as a technical writer writing how-to manuals about other things. So it really happened that I, that I sensed a kind of technical quality in my, in my writing and then became a technical writer. And, then, and I wasn't a particularly good technical writer. I ended up spending most of my time writing impassioned memos to senior management about the design of the, you know, I was, I was a little bit of a troublemaker. Um, so I guess the technical writing was, is something of a dead end for me, in a way. I wonder if you could turn it around and say something about what you're writing now. What's your next project? I, well, I am one of those neurotic writers who, you know, is, is wildly protective about the things that are in progress. Um, each book has been uh, a, an attempt to rectify uh, omissions, a sense of omissions in the book before Vox. I felt that I'd neglected the subject of sex, for instance, and so I had to give it a, a full and honest airing <laughs> uh, with, with Vox. And so I, I, I will try to, the, my wife is really the first person who um, reads the books, and that's uh, I, that'll be true with the next one too. <laughs> well, let me <clears throat> uh, pick things up again if there's some, and so and people can keep on brooding. Um, I was um, intrigued by uh, something that I uh, encountered in room temperature. Uh, in which the protagonist um, entertains this she half serious desire uh, to be Jewish uh, or, or to have um, say or, you know, or, or to be of Jewish descendants um, that's the nose uh, part isn't it that's yes. it, it, it actually <laughs> yes, uh, well. yeah, it, it precedes the nose part I think um, but it's it's at least half serious um, and it also applies uh, up to a point to the uh, you know, the protagonist's wife uh, in that in, in that novel. Um, why? Well, the Jewish American writers were the ones that I liked best. Uh, they're the funniest, you know. Jewish poets are are, are the best. So, also, I that I am Quaker, predominantly Quaker, and there's there are many family traditions about how we were lapsed Jews, and um, so that is autobiographical, the sense that, you know, that I am externally obviously a wasp, and yet, you know, secretly I'm hard, I, I want to be, you know, a Jewish writer, a Jewish American writer. Yeah. It's a strange thing. I, uh, yeah. Now, you, you, you uh, earlier, you said, you asked him, why did you pick uh, Updike instead? And, and not, and, and not the ones, rough, all the ones that you mentioned. 
fellows, uh, male, or I don't know, they're all Jews. Well, that goes back to, to this particular passage. Um, uh, I mean, there's something so cheerful about your writing that it's hard to imagine that this, I mean, that there's any link at all with, uh, uh, say, Jewish American fiction, which um, uh, is usually haunted by, uh, say, anxiety, mm. say, Malamud, oh. uh, Roth, um, uh, Bellow, and even though it's very funny quite often, there is a very, uh, uh, say, serious and quite often uh, uh, pessimistic, if not apocalyptic undertone mm. to Jewish American writing, which is totally lacking from your own work. So yeah. that's, that's why um, it struck me as paradoxical. Well, it was the cheerful side, the funny side, that, that appeals to me in, in that that genre rather than the anguished side. We go back to the, uh, the audience. Hello. Yeah, uh, first a gentleman in the back and then, uh, and then it's your turn again, okay. Uh, I wonder if you've got much uh, feedback from your uh, translators because um, it seems that your, language, your use of language has such a lot of nuance in it, but that was lost in the translation. Your writing maybe could end up sounding like a technical manual in uh, Dutch, or maybe someone in the audience who the Dutch and the English versions could help you out the answer. Um, well, I do get long lists of questions. The Spanish translator especially sent, you know, an eight-page letter with many, many questions about specifics and. Um, the German translator was very curious about what the phrase tap pants, what, what were tap pants? Uh, well, and so I had to Xerox a, a page from a, a, lingerie, a lingerie catalog <laughs> and, uh, you know, fax it to him. Um, but that, that's, those are the, you know, that's, it's kind of fascinating what, that there's almost no overlap between each translator's questions. What is the puzzling thing to move from one language to another differs so radically from each in each case. How long did you write before you realized, hey, I'm a writer? Um, I started writing when I was 20 in 1977, and I first got published when I was 24. The first fiction I did was when I was 20, so it took me four years to get published. And it, but I didn't really feel that I had hit on my style on what I what I could do well until I wrote that that chapter about a man getting dressed, and I felt that I was finally, by adopting the first person, um, able to speak in a way that was closer to the way I thought. So, and that was when I was. Uh, um, 26. So it took me uh, six years of work. Well, I, I really enjoyed doing this all. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. No, I enjoyed it. Thanks for all of the questions. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having been here tonight. Um, and I thank the gentleman, Bradley, of course, it was thank very you. interesting. Uh, our program has slightly altered. Uh, the, th the next lecture will be on the 3rd of April. It will be with Charles Johnson. All information is in the hall. I hope the camera didn't bother you too much, but we are considering an evening about the New Yorker, as Hans Berten said. Thank you very much.